unfortunately, so many people out there are struggling with infertility. And I think the savvier individuals who are really trying to get to the bottom of why they might be struggling to either get pregnant or to stay pregnant will turn to really important things like nutrition or maybe some key supplementation. But I think a huge missing piece of all this is how light influences fertility and how light also impacts the health of the mitochondria, which I'm going to go into a little bit more about how all this ties into fertility and some strategies that, that might never not, might not typically be considered when it comes to optimizing fertility. Um, and even if you're not dealing with infertility, but you just want to optimize your hormones and then your fertility at some point in time, this applies to you as well. So why or how does light influence hormones? Well, first and foremost, remember, our hormones are not just produced nilly, willy nilly in the body, right? They're not just made randomly. Um, and a lot of a lot of uh, women understand this because they can track ovulation or they can track um, like surges in different hormones at different times throughout the monthly cycle. And so it's uh, and so yes, there are lunar or infradian, I should say, maybe monthly variations in when hormones are at different levels that can impact fertility. But on a day to day basis, there's also a circadian uh, a way that hormones get produced and released. And we need to optimize that circadian output of, of sex hormones in order to optimize a monthly output of hormones so that they can be optimized for fertility. And so one of the ways that this happens is that when the sun reaches the horizon at sunrise, it starts to release or um, into our local environment, we start to get more blue light, right? That increase in blue at sunrise is a signal to the start of the day to my brain. And I, I'm designed to see that through naked eyes. Those naked eyes are communicating that the day has started to the clock in my brain called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And then that gets con uh, that message gets conveyed to various organ centers of the body. And one of those pathways involves the hypothalamic, pituitary gonadal access or reproductive access. Another one that, that's also involved is the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. So what, what do I mean? What's going on here when this axis of communication kickstarts? Well, at sunrise, those pathways are designed to kick off. And when those pathways are initiated, the mitochondria in the adrenal glands and in the reproductive organs make a master sex hormone or steroid hormone called pregnenolone. So essentially cholesterol is converted into pregnenolone by the mitochondria when they get the signal that the day has started. Why does this happen? Well, one of the main reasons why this happens is because that pregnenolone beca can become all the other sex hormones, right? It can literally get divvied up or metabolized into all the other sex hormones. And one of those hormones that we don't necessarily consider to be a sex hormone, but it absolutely falls in that pathway is cortisol. So we're designed to make that pregnenolone, and then some of that pregnenolone becomes this natural surge of cortisol in the morning that surges into the bloodstream and is a circadian blood marker of the start of the day. And with that circadian blood marker, a whole bunch of other pathways are also kicked off and initiated and supported. But not all the pregnenolone becomes cortisol. We get a natural healthy surge of cortisol, and then the remaining pregnenolone can get divvied up into the hormones of fertility based on things like what time of the month it is, but also based on things like um, what are the safety signals that Carrie is perceiving. So if I'm looking to get pregnant, do I feel like I'm in a safe environment or safe situation to do so? And some of the ways that we can tend to that safety signal is through nourishment. So syncing up with a nutrient-rich breakfast um, will allow the body to understand that, oh yeah, we're, we're being fed. There's no scarcity here. Um, doing things that support the nervous system so that we can bring our body out of fight or flight. So we can say, yes, I am perceiving safety in my environment. And with those, with those perceptions of safety, the other hormones, the other reproductive hormones can start to get divvied up into a balanced amount of progesterone, testosterone, estrogen, DHEA, again, in conjunction with what time of the month it is. Um, and so those all tie in together and those hormones influence other hormones of fertility like FSH and LH. And so you start to see how all of this is synced together um, and, and they're all this is all connected, but so many of us are missing that natural circadian surge that we're designed to get. 
Unfortunately, most of us are actually getting what uh, um, an unnecessary secondary surge of these hormones at night, at a circadian inappropriate time. Because when we see artificial light at night, we also start, we'll, we'll start to produce cortisol again because the amount of blue in that artificial light essentially stimulates my brain to say, oh, d another day has started. So the brain will suppress the pr production of melatonin and instead elevate cortisol again. And with that elevation of cortisol comes another elevation of the steroid hormones, which is why we see the research indicating that exposure to that artificial light at night is a driving factor for hormone-driven cancers where you've got kind of imbalanced amounts of, let's say, estrogen metabolism. It is also involved with symptoms of estrogen dominance, PCOS. A lot of, uh, a lot of conditions where we see hormone imbalance is being now being tied to exposure to that artificial light at night. And that's, this is not talked about at all in the world of fertility. And I find it to be absolutely foundational. In fact, my colleague and friend, Sarah Kleiner, was only able to get pregnant in her 40s. And she did so naturally after multiple miscarriages plus failed IVF when she, only when she started to apply these strategies. And so this is absolutely foundational. And we have taught a course about this called Quantum Fertility, where we get uh, emails of, of past participants with their pictures of their babies who say, I, I was able to get pregnant because of this course, because of this information. This is what allowed my body to finally come into balance, to conceive and to carry a beautiful baby to term. So, uh, so it's such a rewarding thing to be able to share with people. And again, if fertility isn't something that you might be dealing with, uh, looking to optimize, eat, think about conditions, any conditions of hormone imbalance from perimenopause, to, um, to, like I said before, PCOS, to just general symptoms of estrogen dominance or things like that. This is a missing piece of the puzzle. Um, and again, we when, when we talk about fertility from this quantum lens, we talk, we talk a lot about light and we talk about a lot about circadian rhythms because that's essential. We also talk about leptin. Leptin is a hormone that actually tells our body how much energy we have stored. And if we don't have adequate energy storage, well, then the body is not going to think that we're in a safe position in order to conceive. Because in order to conceive and grow a baby, we have to potentially be able to pull from fat as a fuel source in order to nourish that baby. Um, you know, through through breastfeeding, we've got to be able to have have enough uh, fat as a fuel source stored in our bodies to be able to produce enough enough breast milk. And so this all ties to leptin. And leptin links directly to light and dark. So if we're not getting adequate light signaling and we're not getting adequate darkness at night, leptin signaling can absolutely go awry. And so again, the other thing about leptin that can where, where we can influence leptin is through nourishment. My leptin was off. I was the person who would get hangry every three hours, um, which means that my body wasn't able to tap into fat as a fuel source. And because it couldn't tap into fat as a fuel source, it instead initiated a strong hunger and craving signal in me. And when I started to, and what was, what I was also doing at that time when I was getting hangry was I was skipping breakfast and maybe starting my day eating at around lots of coffee and then starting my day eating at, let's say, oh, 12, one, two o'clock, right. In the afternoon. Um, and my, and my body was missing this, the signal of safety and nourishment in the morning. And for a while there, I thought I was feeling good with it, but doing it day in and day out time and time again, it just kept on driving me to get hangry and it drove me to get hangry. And went with hangry, I also noticed symptoms of hormone imbalance. So my cycles were out of whack. My libido tanked. My, um, my body felt puffy, like I was holding onto water. Um, and so all of that, again, shifted and changed when I started to understand light and then leptin and how leptin signaling is very supportive in my body. And then the last one I want to talk about in this video, because we could, we could talk about water and deuterium and non-native electromagnetic fields. There, there, there's some really important topics around this, which I can dive deeper into. So if you're interested in learning more, let me know. But in particular, um, one of the things that I want people to be aware of is mitochondrial health. I think it's, I think maybe mitochondrial health is in, in the lens of fertility is starting to become more of an awareness, but in, for the actual fertilization to occur, when that fertilization occurs, the cell generates literally this pulse, this charge of energy, and that's determined by the mitochondria. In each and every egg cell, there are between 500,000 and 1 million mitochondria. 
if we compare that to our next most densest cells with mitochondria, we would say brain cells. Some brain cells can have 10,000, maybe up to 100,000 mitochondria, but we're talking five to 10 times more in the egg cell. And the health of those mitochondria dictates the healthy energy production that the cells of this growing baby, are, that the, the energy essentially that this growing baby is going to need in order to continue healthy cell division and to generate all of the, all the organ systems in the body and to grow. Um, and so mitochondrial health is massively important and light absolutely ties into mitochondrial health. When we don't get correct circadian signaling, we, we can have an issue with our mitochondria and their ability to generate adequate energy for us. And there's things that we can do in order to help support our mitochondria. Um, one of the things that we can do is get the, that natural light exposure through the skin. So yes, circadian signaling through the eyes, but getting healthy natural light or sun exposure onto our skin will help to maximize mitochondrial energy production. And again, things that just aren't talked about through the lens of fertility. And so I hope you begin to realize that when you're looking at dealing with, when you're looking to support hormone balance and especially hormone balance throughout the course of a monthly cycle to optimize fertility and not only to optimize fertility, but then mitochondrial health to optimize conception and then the growing and development of a baby, you absolutely have to look at that quantum level in order to, to bring this type of support that we're talking about here. And so quantum health, I think, plays a key role and it is massively overlooked these days. If you are on a journey looking to optimize fertility, check out the course that I've created with Sarah Kleiner. It's an on-demand course called Quantum Fertility. And if you're a practitioner, each of the lessons, not only not only do we have lessons and sub-lessons in each of the modules for people dealing um, with optimizing their own fer fertility, both men and women, but also we have um, entire essentially lessons just for the lens, just through the lens of practitioners as well. So what can, what can a practitioner do to opt to help optimize mitochondria in patients from cold? What does cold therapy look like? What about deuterium? What about breathing? What about red light therapy? What about gathering charge, right? All of these concepts through the lens of quantum health that I think uh, go a long way and add a lot of essential tools to your clinician's toolbox to optimize fertility in your clients.